So I'm about to watch Expendables 4 or Expendables. Anyway, I'm, I'm totally prepared to be disappointed. I know I'm going to be disappointed. Like, it's 100% clear by the cast list that they learned nothing from part three. I'm expecting trash. But, uh, you know, Equal Wires and Tony Jarre are in it. Who knows? Maybe there's at least some action worth watching. Maybe not. Who knows? I'm going in. So... We're about 30 minutes into the film, and as to be expected, it's fucking atrocious. The whole thing looks like a cartoon, even, even when they don't need to CGI buildings and shit behind people, because nobody cares. It's just a warehouse or whatever. They're like CGIing buildings and stuff behind people. The, the CGI plane taking off from the airport... Is worse than anything in Escape from L.A. I know everyone complains about the CGI in Escape from L.A., but, you know, we're however many, like 30 years later or whatever, and I'm sorry, Expendables or whatever you're called, that is, that is the word. Why are you CGIing a plane taking off from an airport? Just what? Also, like, 30 minutes in and, like, nothing, nothing has really happened. They could have condensed everything in the first... 30 minutes to about five minutes. There's been a whole pointless... They've, like, crowbarred in a ton of Stallone because, and here are the spoilers, 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 Stallone's character, Barney Ross, is killed off and expended for balls. Which, you know, would be, would, would be emotional. They do this whole thing with Statham, like slow-mo running at the camera with, like, CGI shit behind him, and he's all like, oof, 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 in, like, slow-motion state <laughs> going towards the camera. Meanwhile, the plane's crashing, and we know Barney's on the front of the plane. You see the plane, like, goes, like, the nose of the plane go, like, smashing into the earth, and everything blows up, and blah, 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 right? And all you would need to do is have Lee Christmas look up into the... That's Statham's character. <laughs> People who don't follow the Expendables uh, franchise as closely as I have. Uh, Lee Christmas, that's that's Jason Statham's character. He runs up to the, the cockpit. And, you know, what, what should be an emotional moment for uh, Expendables fans is rendered... <laughs> just incomprehensibly silly and also and also like weirdly grotesque they show the like rotten <laughs> burning corpse of Stallone and it's just you're like well I mean no <laughs> you know we know that the plane crashed and blew up like why are you showing his rotting smoking corpse in this cartoon of a movie. I mean, the the dialogue. I mean, look, I'm not about to claim that either Statham or Stallone, are, you know, is the next Lawrence Olivier. But, and that's for a good thing, by the way, because Lawrence Olivier, as far as I could tell, was always Lawrence Olivier. It's never like I watched the film and went, cool, I don't know who that is. Anyway, I know this Olivier bollocks. It, it, it's not like either Statham or Stallone are exactly, you know, a De Niro or whatever. That's probably it. But I've seen them be really, really good and stuff. Like, really, really good and stuff. And I know that there was, like, problems with the producer of this movie and Stallone wanted out and the, all, all this sort of stuff behind the scenes. People keep ripping Stallone's franchises away from them and uh, woe betide them because all that lies that way is is foolhardiness, madness, and failure. Pots and pots of failure. Uh, so, uh, you know, producers of the Expendables franchise, fuck you. Because you should have just let Stallone write this shit. Because I'm pretty sure he would have made up for Expendables 3 by making this one a lot better. But so far, I, I mean, there, there's been like two action sequences 
One of which was about 30 seconds of Statham hitting people with brass knuckles in a bar. And the other one being about five minutes of them just driving through some warehouses and lots of CGI blood. And then when Stallone's character dies, instead of giving it a bit of dignity and just having it all look at, like, the camera just look at Statham, Statham look aghast, looking into the cockpit, everyone else show up, whatever, that would be fine. But they showed, like, this street trash style, melty face Stallone puppet at looking like something out of Dust Till Dawn. And I'm like, well, why are they pulling out the practical effects now? It's been CGI wank. Like, not even... I've seen computer games that look better than this. I've seen computer games from, like, 1998 that look better than this. Oh, man, they deserve so much better. And if you can't get Antonio Banderas, replacing him with some Antonio Banderas but younger doing an impression of Antonio Banderas... Like, why... Why would I want to watch that, right? Because the thought process there is, well, everyone loved Antonio Banderas in part three. No, no, no they didn't, but all right. Uh, so what we need to do is continue the Antonio Banderas vibe uh, in this one, uh, while simultaneously leaving the door open for Banderas to come back in future episodes, which is balmy to me bizarre to me that any producer of any film seeing the gradual decline in grosses from any of these movies and and the horrendous uh critical reception for part three the idea that you'd be like well you know if banderas can't make this one he might be able to make the next one it's just it's it's a level of ego and cocksuredness that i don't even think i don't even think seagal would be that kind of uh, blinded by his own... Brill no, actually, Seagal would. He'd be blinded by his own... But uh, I just... I'm so baffled by this. But I guess Stallone just died, and I just had to see his rubbery, melty street trash puppet sitting in the cockpit of a burning plane. This is one bizarre movie. But off we go. Off we go. So there's a whole bunch of expendables that you spend uh, thinking, I don't want to be watching this. <laughs> Why am I watching Megan Fox and other people I have no interest in whatsoever walk around and then get captured? Why am I watching this? Then, out of nowhere, the movie becomes Jason Statham in Die Hard on a Boat with, weirdly, <laughs> I mean, it might as well, it might as well take influence from this, weirdly, with a huge Megaforce sequence with Statham on a motorbike <laughs> with little guns on the front. Guns on the front of a motorbike, which seemingly never runs out of ammo, which is convenient. But they do all this old Megaforce thing. Uh, in fact, people haven't seen Megaforce. It's a, a movie uh, from the early 80s, I think, starring Barry Bostwick, of all people, as a feather-haired lunatic on a flying motorbike. So we've had, it <laughs> suddenly becomes Die Hard on a boat with Statham and Megaforce. And I was quite enjoying that. And then uh, Tony Jaa, who was in earlier in the movie, um, who they kind of teased was just a very quick cameo and wasn't going to come back. 
he came back into the fray and he like helped Statham take out some henchmen, innumerous henchmen, by the way, on this boat. They are spending a lot on henching at the moment and uh, they could have cut their hench budget in half, really. Uh, anyway, Tony Jar shows back up and starts like uh, karate chopping people left and right. And that's where it struck me. The other thing that this uh, Expendables 4 lacks, or Expend for Balls, Expend for Balls. That's true. Uh, the other thing that Expend for Balls doesn't have is it doesn't have the score uh, of the masterful Brian Tyler, the incredible Brian Tyler. And Brian, uh, he's a close friend of mine, uh, we once talked on the phone, Brian would have uh, heralded that moment with some like, bum, ba -da -ba, like he would have... Uh, Obviously only in a cool, dark, action-y, mysterious way. But he would have done a little bit of... Doom, 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 you know, like his uh, Expendables thing. Oh, I don't, that, that wasn't good. Don't, don't use that. Cut it. Cut it. Wait, I'm editing this. Anyway, uh, he would have done some, like, big action theme. Uh, and it suddenly made me realise why this is so unbelievably dull. There's no music. Like, there's no music. And when there is music, you wish there wasn't music. Even PM Entertainment, and they had some tone-deaf twazzock on a Casio keyboard driving us all mad. Even PM Entertainment, who had that guy, Jeff Casio, whatever his name was, even that guy knew that when, like, action was happening, you kept the... Rum -ta -ta -tum -ta -tum -ba 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 -ba, you kept the brass, or in his case, his little, like, Casio Tonka thing, but you know, you, you kept the momentum here. Tony Jar shows up with a big reveal. Here's Statham and Jar here to save the day, and uh, not so much as a a little, not even a little, uh, not even someone using a jaw harp to twang out dun, 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 like dang dang dang, like not even that, not even that. So while the movie slowly redeemed itself with all the state nanigans going on, it could just... It, the, the direction and the music is, is letting it down. This is... It's so cheap as well. Like, it literally looks... I don't know. So I grew up in England and certain sitcoms that were made for BBC Two had a, had a certain look to them. Uh, Red Dwarf was one. Like, Red Dwarf had a certain cheap look to it and you, you totally respected it because it was shot in a cupboard in BBC Television Centre for Thrupton's Hapney. Uh, <laughs> in a bag of onion crisps. But there's no excuse for a 2023 Expendables movie to look like bloody Red Dwarf. But it does. It looks like... And not, not like more recent sexy Red Dwarf. Like early, proper, funny, grotty Red Dwarf where there was like two cardboard beds and a and a light switch. And they just went, oh, it's on a spaceship. Deal with it. <laughs> anyway, back to the Stath nanigans. All right, so the movie just finished. <laughs> and, of course, Stallone was alive the whole time. Oh, it was all part of his big plan. Oh, oh wonderful. No one really died. This was written <laughs> by Kurt Wimmer and Tad Daggerheart. I'm not making that up. Kurt Wimmer and Tad Daggerheart with help by Max Adams. Who are these people? I want to find whoever Tad Daggerheart is and I want to bounce his face off the pavement for making me sit through that film. God, it was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. Like, I knew it was going to be bad. Like, I knew it was going to be just awful. But this was really, really, really bad. Kurt Wimmer and Tad Daggerheart. Ugh. It, like, and it just, it ends with, like, a cover version of The Boys Are Back in Town. Like, a really bad, cheap cover version of it. As if, as if you hadn't just sat through a cheap, shitty cover version of The Expendables. 
They want to just drill at home, just grind it right into your bones. Oh yeah, this was a shitty cover version, and to prove it, here's a shitty cover version. Tad Daggerheart, coming for you. So, as I sit here editing the video you're watching right now, the next day, I don't know that any of that makes any sense, but it's still me. It's, I'm just wearing new clothes. Anyway, as I sit here editing that, and I'm looking up the Expendables online to see if I can get any more information about Tad Daggerheart and his ilk. The budget, the estimated budget of that movie was a hundred million dollars. Well, I'm sorry. I understand like groceries are expensive now, whatever it is. Oh, the cost of living increase and all the rest of it. But a hundred million dollars on that wank. A hundred million dollars. I'm sorry, if you gave me a hundred million dollars, I could make 50 Expendables movies and they'd be a fuck sight more entertaining than whatever the God damn Tad Daggerheart mess that was. Ugh. Oh, and I forgot to mention the video last night because I was too angry. But the end joke of the movie, right? The, the, the joke, like, you know, all action movies at a certain point follow the He-Man template, which is once all the action is done, your heroes gather back together and there is a comedy bit that everyone... <laughs> chuckles at and then the the music plays right the, so earlier in the movie by the way all of this is irrelevant so don't worry about it but <laughs> i mean this whole video is irrelevant <laughs> but you're still watching it so good luck anyway earlier in the movie to get his ring back which again this this sequence did not need to be in the film except to be like well what great pals Statham and Stallone are, but we've had three movies to know what great pals Statham and Stallone are. So, in fact, if anything, establishing what good friends Statham and Stallone are, only for Stallone to, like, fake his death and then not help them at all until the very last minute, that, as a friend, I'd just be like, wait, wait, you were alive this whole time? Like, I put myself at risk. I almost went down with a nuclear bomb on a ship to save your memory and to, like, preserve the mission, and you were just alive the whole time? What? Anyway, earlier in the movie, to show what good friends Stallone and Stath are, Stallone shows up at his house, where Stath is having the worst argument with Megan Fox ever committed. I mean, I've seen soap operas with, like, better acting, better dialogue, better arguments, better everything, better set design, better... I mean, a hundred million dollars! Are you fucking kidding me? What did that go on? <laughs> Statham's head wax and a couple of leather jackets. Like, what? Anyway, Stallone says, we got, oh, we've got to go to the club to get my ring back because I lost my ring in a game of thumb wrestling or something. I mean, it, it's just, it's just a bit, like, I don't know if it, this is meant to be a comedy scene, this is meant to be an action scene. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, they go to the club. And they meet this guy called Jumbo Shrimp, who's like this tiny little guy who has all these henchmen and bodyguards and whatever. And Jason Statham hits them all with the aforementioned knuckle dusters, right? They get Stallone's ring back and, and away they go. And then when Stallone's street trash, melty puppet body is in the cockpit of the plane and Statham knows it's him because he's got the ring on his finger and Statham takes the ring and whatever. Anyway, later on, it's revealed Stallone faked his death. And Statham, at the end of the movie, Statham goes, well, who was in the cockpit? And he goes, well, you remember Jumbo Shrimp? And it literally shows Stallone getting this poor little guy with a mustache out of a cupboard on the plane, slams him down into the pilot seat, right, put with, with like, Stallone's costume on, and leaves him to die in a plane, right, Fate, so puts the ring on his finger and leaves him to like die horribly like an agonizing exploding plane in the face death and he goes oh you remember Jumbo Shrimp so you see this flashback to him being put in the cockpit whatever and then it just cuts back to Jason Statham he just goes oh you didn't and then they go he goes I did and then they laugh I'm like what so wait a minute I get it they're, they're guys who they've killed innumerable henchmen why do I care about this character, Jumbo Shrimp, that they literally invented just to have this whole business about the ring and blah. I mean, it's I mean, it's, it's it's agonizing how bad the screenplay is. But anyway, we're okay at the end of the movie that our heroes, 
who, you know, yes, they're mercenaries or whatever, uh, but, you know, they have a code. One assumes they have a code. But we're okay at the end of this movie that Stallone flat out murdered a dude. Like, flat out murdered a dude. And, I mean, put a, put a dummy in the pilot seat. No one was expecting to find your charred remains because the fucking plane blew up. Like, like just put, like, a, p a pillow... I know, right, but then there wouldn't be the ring. Oh, and then the writers would have to figure out how to get the ring into it. The ring that has no bearing on anything. But they're like, well, you know, it's it's like, it reminds me in Halloween 2018 where they, they uh, at the beginning, they're like, oh, the mask is magic. The mask isn't magic. He just picks it up in a Halloween store. It's just a mask he finds. It's not magic, you fucking cretinous assholes. I bet fucking Tad Wangledanger or whatever his name is. I bet he fucking wrote Halloween 2018 as well. But they're all the the magic of the mask and we're two British podcasters and fuck off Halloween 2018 and all of your sequels. Anyway, it's like that where they go, well, you know, in all the previous episodes of or previous uh, entries into the Expendables franchise, Stallone seems to care much about this ring. So we better make a big deal about the ring. Why? Why? Stop it. Stop now. Get rid of the ring. It's irrelevant. Anyway, uh, we're laughing at the end of the movie because Stallone flat out murdered a dude. That's how this movie ends. A hundred million dollars. I bet that all went on Tad Wilma Piss's fucking <laughs> rewrites or whatever the fuck he did. It, it, it's, it's entirely worrying that two of the three writers for this movie are simply known for script and continuity department. Which means that before they wrote this film, they basically sat around going, no, 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 he should be standing over there. Or, wait, he said this in the last scene or whatever. Doesn't indicate that they know anything about writing whatsoever. As this movie clearly points out. Now, what's his name? Kurt, Kurt Wimmer. Kurt Wimmer. He's written uh, some movies you might actually know. Uh, Equilibrium uh, with uh, Christian Bale. The Total Recall uh, remake. The Point Break remake. I mean, you know, we're not talking... Oh, the Children of the Corn remake. Wow. <sighs> yeah, so he, he's written a bunch of crap. Yeah, wow. The Thomas Crown Affair remake. Wow, this guy really likes to write remakes. The only one that's even particularly worth anything that he's written is Law Abiding Citizen with Judd Butler! But apart from that, never let these people anywhere near a screen or a... a... Also, look look at this. I want to show you fucking Kurt Wimmer. Give me a second here. You see this? That's not what a writer looks like. That's not what a writer looks like. No, Kurt Wimmer. Writers aren't meant to look like that. Writers are meant to be bags under the eyes, anxiety riddled, like late middle aged people who have been scribbling on yellow notepads their entire life and have like really bad wrists and you know no one I mean no one like writers are not meant to be handsome is what I'm saying uh and I'm sorry any writers out there but you're not meant to be stop trying to what is this Kurt Wimmer just stop it stop all of this right now it's awful button up your fucking shirt you you, you fucking prick and stop pouting for the camera like a oh I'm so angry I'm having a go at Kurt Wimmer's shirt at this point. I just don't even know anymore. I just don't even know anymore. Enough. All right, that's enough about Expendables. I'm done. I'm done. Never let Kurt Wimmer near anything ever again. Or fucking Tad Thundercock or whatever his name was.